Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Attention ranchers, transform your land, livestock, and livelihood with Noble Research's regenerative management courses. Learn from their expert advisors and unlock proven strategies to enhance soil health, improve forage quality, reduce operation costs, and increase profitability. Through hands-on workshops, you'll gain skills to build a resilient and thriving ranch for generations to come. Space is limited. Visit noble.org today to explore their regenerative management courses and enroll. Invest today in your land, livestock, and and livelihood. That link is also in the show notes. Hey, hey, folks, welcome back to another episode today. And we are going to be visiting with Joe Poquet to wrap up the regenerative ranching series. Joe and I discussed the challenges and rewards that come from the first five years of intentionally applying regenerative principles. And so the three main points that Joe covers when he talks about his own experiences with making some of these changes are the pros and cons of starting slow versus fast how to stay motivated when playing the long game, and the importance of continuously observing. So when Joe and I recorded this, for me, it was a cold yet sunny morning in North Dakota, and my husband and I are in the beginning stages of calving season, which has given me a lot of thinking time as I take the early morning checks. And one of the questions that came up for me this morning that I was pondering and also ironically came up during the conversation with Joe was about how we see our own herds and our businesses. So when you observe your herd, your business, your management practices, are you truly looking at them with a clean slate? Meaning when you look, are you seeing what you want to see or are you allowing yourself to see them for what they truly are and removing all of that bias? And Joe will cover this a little more in the conversation. So just keep this question in mind. And I know what my answer would be. I somewhat. I'm still working on it. I don't think it's one that we can always have a set answer on right away, but I'd really encourage you to think about it and send me a message. Send me your thoughts, whether that's through social media DM. My handle is at cattle convos. You can reply to my weekly newsletter if you get that or send me a form on my website. I'd really like to hear your thoughts about this question or about this whole series in general. But with that, let's jump into the conversation with Joe. Alrighty, Joe. Well, I really appreciate you taking time to be on the show today and you get to round out this series about regenerative principles and I guess regenerative ranching in general. So thank you for taking time out of your day to visit with me. And so to get started, I'd really like for you to share with myself and the listeners a little bit about your background um, as it relates to agriculture, but specifically um, understanding regenerative principles. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. I uh, I started my trip in agriculture in northwestern Colorado, and I didn't grow up on on a ranch. Uh, my parents had town jobs. You know, my dad was a mechanic and my mom was a bookkeeper. But I've been very fortunate to work with some of the the best people in agriculture in northwest Colorado, and then again in northern Oklahoma, and really fueled my passion for being a good steward of the land and being a good you know, husband to the cows. I, I still like it called animal husbandry, not so much animal science. So I kind of got started and uh, worked with some really great people, some very conservation minded people, which kind of set me up to see the world as I see it today. Well, I think I say this every time someone comes on the show and they tell me they didn't grow up in the, necessarily on a ranch, but they still found their way to be involved in agriculture. That group of people is sometimes my favorite group of people to have on the show because they can come with such an unbiased viewpoint compared to some of us like myself where I'm the fifth generation. So it's I've always really appreciate those perspectives on the show. So tell me a little bit more about what you're doing with Noble today. So today I'm the general ranch manager for Noble. And so Noble Noble owns about 13,500 acres and we break those into six different ranches. And so they're all very, very different from each other, different soil types, different ecological context. And so I kind of help organize and kind of the strategy for what we're going to graze and how we're going to manage them across the whole. So every ranch has a ranch manager and we all kind of work together to make noble ranches as a whole function. 
are all of those in Oklahoma? Yes, ma'am. Yep. They're all about an hour of, of Ardmore in either direction. Okay. How much work do you do directly with producers? Uh, not a whole lot. I, I, I do quite a few um, touring of the ranches and showing kind of what our our practices are and kind of communicating how our finances have changed and our management philosophies have changed. I do a lot of that, but I don't I don't do direct consulting or anything, but I, I do get quite a bit of interaction with, with people that are curious about what we're doing. So diving right into the topic where we're going to be talking about the first five years of producers being more intentional, intentional about implementing regenerative principles and changing their practices. If you could change any one thing that producers do during those first five years, what would that be? You know, it's, it's the scientific answer. It just always depends, depends on everybody's context and what, what they're dealing with. I think the one kind of universal practice that we all need to focus on is having patience and really focusing on our mindset so more than just changing the way you graze or changing the way you plant crops or whatever the practice is that you're focused on that has to be fueled by a mindset change you know the way that we have ran cattle businesses for the last 50 100 years aren't as profitable as they are today just you know the way the economy's changed and input prices have changed and cattle prices really haven't changed in comparison to those things, right? So our old production model, it's really hard to continue to be profitable in this new era of higher inputs in the way we are now. So really the one thing that we need to think about when we're changing our practices is what's the mindset behind it. And if you, and that just goes into all sorts of things. So when you start changing the way you graze, say, there might be a lot of weeds. We like to call them forbs, but there might be a lot of weeds that come and if you see orbs as a bad thing, that that really might bother you. And that's where the patience and the mindset comes in. If you're able to change the way you observe things and see weeds as a forb that are bringing beneficial nutrients to the soil, it's also creating a ton of biodiversity on top of the soil and below the soil that that will fuel your desire to continue to do the things that are positive for soil health. So how can producers work on getting their mind in the right place when they get started? Because that can be a huge shift. I mean, for how many years and generations has it been drilled into a lot of people? Grass is grass and weeds are weeds and there's good and there's bad. And it can be hard to maybe take a step back and really fully look at that bigger picture when that generational mindset is so ingrained in us. Where can producers start with maybe shifting that mindset a little more it's it's twofold for so for me it was more education trying to figure out what i was looking at so when i when i first started grazing animals more intensely it was about 7 years ago and i i had about 2500 yearlings in a couple acre paddock and it rained an inch that night which i wasn't expecting and i guess wasn't really planning for cuz i wasn't grazing intensely like that as before. And when I showed up in the morning, it was a mud hole. And so I moved the cow right away and was really concerned that I had done a really bad thing. Well, I let it rest for 60 to 75 days and it was some of the most productive parts of that whole pasture. So that's what it was self-serving for me at that time. Like, okay, like something happened here. I don't know what I don't know. I need to educate myself a little bit as why this is going on. And that's, that's what kind of got me on the regenerative path is, you know, I, I realized that there's a lot that I don't know. And knowing that I know that I don't know, that kind of fuels me into continuing down the path of, well, what, what do I not know? Like, let's just, let's go into it and figure it out. So, you know, I think education is the biggest thing, but on top of that, I, I personally, I've really worked on observing and, seeing things for what's actually there and not putting my, you know, my, my lens of whatever I think is happening there. And one of my best examples of that is, you know, I was responsible for a pretty large yearling operation in Southern Kansas. And if I went out expecting to see sick cattle, I would find sick cattle all the time. That's what I was looking for. And I would find them. If I went out to see healthy cattle, I found healthy cattle all the time and I wouldn't see the sick ones. 
So just being able to see objectively what's going on and observe what's happening is such a huge skill that I continue to work on all the time and not let my biases kind of determine how my brain in inputs what my eyes are seeing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Do you think it's valuable for <clears throat> producers to sometimes bring in an extra set of eyes for their operation, whether it's a neighbor or a consultant or someone else right away when they're getting started, just to make sure you're removing some of that barn blindness and bias that can come with things? Sure. It always helps to have, have another set of eyes. It's always easier to tell your neighbor what to do than it is <laughs> to tell yourself, right? So there's always that. Um, it's always beneficial. You don't you, you want to make sure that you're asking the right the right questions, not to to maybe have their biases imprinted on what you're trying to see too. So it's it's just an open mindedness, you know, trying to keep your mindset to be observant of what is actually happening. What what do I want to see? Am I seeing what I want to see, or am I seeing what's happening? So I think this really segues into another question that I really wanted to ask you. I mean, you already talked about, you know, education is important and we don't know what we don't know, but what are some of those main challenges that people really face within the first five years? If you can think of a few, I know you talked about how a lot of things depend, but what are some of those main challenges that some people make? Well, it's, it's a long game. You know, the, the soil changes in a, different timeline than our world operates in, especially now where we're all connected and we're talking through a computer instantly in two different parts of the world, right? And so we're used to things happening really fast and nature just doesn't work on the same time frame that we do. So being able to remain patient through the process, and it's just gonna like it's gonna depend on the weather and the soil type and how you're managing it as to what changes you see right away when you start implementing regenerative practices and following the regenerative principles, right? That's the big thing is following the principles and those practices lead into that. But, um, you know, <clears throat> mainly it's try to do, try to continue to do the things that are positive for soil health, because as long as you're doing positive things, those will keep compounding on each other. So Joe, going back to that long game conversation, how do you still how do you still stay motivated and focused on the long game I mean I know that's something that cattle producers are used to in a lot of ways I mean it's hard to get into agriculture on a thinking you're gonna get rich quick or any scheme like that but how do you stay motivated and focused on these practices even though you know that you aren't necessarily going to reap all the benefit and reward in your lifetime. And you're putting all this effort in to caring for the soil. And I, I think it's the motivation really is key in the first couple of years, because when things start changing, when you start changing your management practices, it may be like a linear change. Things happen pretty slow in the beginning, but once there's a point, and I feel like that's where noble ranches sit right now. And hopefully we can, visit again next year and I can explain how exponentially things have gotten way better. So we, we see kind of incremental linear changes now, but once, once we get our, you know, the critical mass, if we have enough active biology in our soil, it just on the works of Alan Williams and other Gabe Brown, you know, the understanding ag guys, everything, everybody that's done this for a lot longer than we have, the, the growth after that is exponential, right? So what, if we do the right things long enough and stay patient, and continue to apply the, you know, pr proper soil health principles, then once that growth becomes exponential, it becomes a lot easier because you get these big wins and you see things changing. So one thing we try to really focus on the ranches is try to get little wins that are going the right way to kind of keep us, Hey, that, you know, that was really cool. We like, so examples of some little wins we have now, we haven't, what was that? 2020, we probably, fed for four or five months, fed hay for four or five months to all the cows. And we had fed for maybe 15 days of supplemental hay this year, just weather related, really an ice storm or a snowstorm or something like that. So those are little wins for us that keep us motivated. Like, Hey, because we're managing our grazing and we're doing some more adaptive grazing, we have cut out not only just the cost of the hay to feed it, but all the labor associated with it. The cows look good. There's we're not starving them or anything, you know, it, it's 
it, we took the hay out because we didn't need it. We had the grass standing. Yeah. So just keeping those little wins, keeping keeping positive about the the mindset and just I think too like a, a good network of peers that can help and say like, you know, this, yeah, this this is tough. You're you're going through it, but you're doing the right things. It's gonna be okay. That that always is is positive too. So you talked about the almost hay feeding metric, like how many days do we have to feed hay in a sense? And you're using that to kind of measure your little wins. What other metrics can producers measure or track throughout the year just to get excited about those little wins and stay focused and understand that they are making progress? You know, like anecdotally, if you're if you're really working on your observation, we, we like to look at new plants that come, higher successional plants. You know, in, in our part of the world, that's eastern gamma grass and big blue stem. We see a lot more of those plants um, arriving in different places where we've grazed. And that's not the scientific way of measuring. That's, you know, out there every day, like, hey, there's a bunch of big blue stem over here. That's that's pretty cool. You know, th those are things that are encouraging for us that, okay, we're doing we're doing the right things. And then, of course, through our research, we can go a lot more scientific and have a baseline soil test, a PL PLFA test, Haney test. We can start analyzing the difference over one or two years and get on the soil level of the changes. And once we see the positives that, you know, that's encouraging to us that we're going the right way. Attention ranchers, transform your land, livestock, and livelihood with Noble Research's regenerative management courses. Learn from their expert advisors and unlock proven strategies to enhance soil health, improve forage quality, reduce operation costs, and increase profitability. Through hands-on workshops, you'll gain skills to build a resilient and thriving ranch for generations to come. Space is limited. Visit noble.org today to explore their regenerative management courses and enroll. Invest today in your land, livestock, and and livelihood. That link is also in the show notes. So Joe, what has been, when you think about your really beginning days, what were your favorite parts of those days? What was the most rewarding part about what you were doing? You know, I, along with, you know, regenerating the soil, I'm a big stockmanship advocate too. And so when we had these large, these large groups of cows and yearlings to death together i i really enjoyed seeing them all together and observing kind of the family units in a cow herd and how how they graze different plants and um being able to to move three thousand yearlings by yourself with a dog i mean one dog and a horse and me but that that was really enjoyable for me and i i liked that i got to see all the cattle all the time i kind of felt like i had a really good feel of what's going on so when we when we talk about moving every day or moving multiple times a day, they're not like big big drives. We're not gathering, you know, thousand acre pastures and moving them to another thousand acre pasture. They're generally pretty small, so you're able to see everything, get a good feel of what what's going on in the cow herd. I was able to keep track of if I was having some kind of bug running through the yearlings, or mm -hmm. you know, that I really enjoyed that part of the of the the stockmanship part of of learning about it, and then. That that was immediate gratification for me, being able to do that every day. And then the kind of the self-feeding gratification came the next growing season or later that year when the ranch took way better. And, you know, my the stewardship that I was responsible for was in better shape than I found it. And that's kind of my always ultimate goal, right? Is we want to leave things better than we found them. And that that's kind of intermediate intermediate satisfaction then the long-term satisfaction at the end of the year when we start figuring out performance metrics and things like that and for example the my yearling cattle gain better than the conventional ranch so the same group of cattle you know if they gain better and we're less sick that that makes you feel pretty good too it makes you feel like you're doing the right thing well and i really appreciate like one thing that you said there was that you did get immediate gratification in this process, even though it is for the long game, like we talked about earlier. So I think that's really a testament to there can be very, there can be satisfaction throughout the whole process. And just like anything, there are challenges and rewards with all of it. Now, one thing that was brought up in other interviews relating to this series was that sometimes people can maybe try and go all in and burn out. Is that a mistake you see people make? Yeah. I mean, it's probably, 
I'm I'm that way. So like when I'm when I'm ready to do something, I I feel like I whether I have or not, taking the time to think about it and I'm kind of all in and it's going to work or it's not. And it's 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 twofold. You can it's like driving a Model T or driving a race car, right? If you take little steps at a time, you'll get little rewards at a time. That's kind of the slower way to get to these to these places like the Model T. If you go all in and do all the things really fast, that's kind of like the Corvette race car, but your chances of crashing in into a tree are a lot higher. So I, I don't know that it's a mistake to go all in. I think it's uh I think I think it's beneficial because you can make a lot of changes faster and maybe understand what you're doing sooner. So a, a good compromise for me is like go all in on a certain section to where you're not completely changing your entire day. You know, do do a hundred acres of something and be a hundred percent about all of it right there and try to prove for yourself if this is worth my time. Is it, am I getting what I think I need to get out of it? Is my land improving? Do the cows handle, you know, the density grazing and things like that? So I think it's, it's not a mistake to go all in. It's probably not advisable to go all in on everything right off the bat until you really understand what that it's still work. I mean, like when you're grazing, you might be trading, the work of sitting in a spray rig for the work of moving cows it's it's all work right but make sure that you're comfortable with trading trading your work out right and so you talked earlier about you know having a good set of peers or maybe even mentors who are open minded and can help you out during this process you briefly touched on that who else is it important to have on your team as you begin being more intentional about your regenerative principles and applying those to your practices? Well, I mean, I'm married, so it's pretty important that me and my wife are on the same page. You know, have, having that support network is really, really important, especially when you're doing something that's out of your own personal comfort zone, you know, just having the, the local support network. But two, I, I always kind of advocate for whatever business support you have. We're We're in the ranching is a business to me and it needs to be treated as a business. And there's all the wonderful things about ranching that we all enjoy, but at the end of the day, it has to be a business to be able to enjoy those things. And so how, however you seek business information, whether it's an accountant or bookkeeping, or, you know, I would, I would think being able to have on your team, the numbers is going to be able to serve you well in the end. Great. Well, Joe, as we kind of wrap up today, do you have any final thoughts or resources that you would like to share with those listening to this episode? Well, I just like to share that, you know, Noble Noble does offer educational courses now. We have the land course, Noble Land Essentials and Noble Grazing Essentials. And then we've just recently partnered with Ranching for Profit, which is, you know, proven business curriculum. So Noble will have a business suite with partnership with them. So I encourage people if they're looking for something to try to look at noble.org and all those, all those things are on there. There's a lot of good articles that everybody at Noble contributes to, and those come out pretty regularly. So they are, I, the newsletter that Noble sends out is also a very good one too. I get that as well. And I did see that partnership with Ranching for Profit. That's pretty exciting for yes, ma'am. both parties involved. All right, Joe. Well, thank you for being a part of this conversation today and sharing your experiences and advice with those listening and rounding out this regenerative series. Thanks for having me. Well, folks, that is a wrap on that one. I appreciate you and Joe for either taking the time to listen, listen to this or, and I appreciate Joe for taking the time to visit with me about this conversation. And thank you, Noble, for really being a part of bringing this regenerative series and having these conversations and making them accessible to everyone. Um, it was a really fun one to do for me. I would really like to hear your feedback about the series. If you like this topic, what other topics you maybe want to hear as they relate to anything in the cattle industry. And as a reminder, one of the best ways to help podcasters is to share the show with your friends, rate and review, and just let us know your thoughts. We really appreciate it. So with that, I appreciate you. Have a great day and happy ranching.